Yeah. Okay, so I'm going to uh, talk about uh, statistics and uh, the uh, medical literature. And uh, statistics as a uh, field of science or a field of mathematics is uh, very sophisticated uh, and very elegant and uh, really pretty hard to understand, at least for me. However, the application of statistics in studying biology is not a science. It's supposed to be a tool. It's supposed to be our servant, not our master. And what's wrong with the literature is that they don't always understand that. So, so this is the conclusion that the results suggest that red meat is going to uh, cause type 2 uh, diabetes. And uh, we know that doesn't make much sense. And the problem is, how do they prove it, and how can we uh, disprove it? So uh, the next slide shows you what you're up against when you uh, do the literature. Uh, well, one of my contributions to the world is, uh, you know, t to tell you what it's like when you have to review a lot of papers when you're a biochemist. And uh, well, what I do is I look for the pictures. And you, you can really tell uh, how good a paper is by the relative amounts of figures versus these uh, mind-numbing uh, uh, tables. One of the problems with statistics is that they, uh, they make things very complicated. The truth is the best statistical test is the eyeball test. If it looks like crap, it is crap. So. Uh, if you look at uh, Nick, next slide, th this shows you the, uh, if, well, the blue is the decline in red meat consumption in the past, well, in the 30 years of what we call the obesity epidemic. And it's a significant drop. It's not a small number. And the red shows you the increase in type 2 diabetes. So it just doesn't make sense that, that those things are correlated. So I think of uh, the useful part of statistics as being something that's simple and straightforward, and you don't need somebody to come in and put a name on it uh, that's complicated. I, I think of this as uh, an uh, analogy with grammar. Now, most of us know how to use our native language, and despite the uh, decline in uh, English usage, we all pretty much know what the right tense is in a sentence. We don't need somebody to come along and tell us, uh, give us a name for that, for some complicated thing that probably applies to Latin anyway. So it's, it's similar, I think it's a good analogy for using statistics. I'll tell you a joke. So this is a, a, a New England joke uh, about scrod. Scrod is a fish dish that, that actually re refers to the method of preparation and it can be made with cod and haddock and so on. So the, these two guys go to Boston, and they ask the cab driver, uh, do you know where we can get scrod? And the cab driver says, uh, I do, but that's the first time I've ever heard it in the past pluperfect. Uh, so so uh, that, that's the idea. We want to keep it simple. OK. Uh, Here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to do a statistical parlor game. Uh, I'm going to, uh, I mentioned that I did this at, in Tampa, so bear with me. And also, it's very popular. There's at least uh, six guys who did it on YouTube. Uh, and it's because it's incredibly cool. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to show you, ask you a question about statistics in a diagnosis, and you're not going to be able to figure it out at all. And then I'm going to reframe this question with the same data in a different way. And then you'll see that uh, it's a piece of cake. So it, it's a, a terrific demonstration. The next slide tells you the uh, uh, what the uh, problem is. There's a, a statistician in uh, Germany who actually did the experiment, and he he proposed this to uh, doctors, and when he proposed the uh, experiment in this way, they couldn't uh, figure it out. Basically, the probability 
uh, that a woman has breast cancer is 0.8%, and the mammogram is 90% accurate. If she has it, the probability is 90% that it will be detected. If a woman does not have breast cancer, uh, the probability is 7% that she'll still have a positive mammogram. So if, if a woman tests positive for a mammogram, what's the probability uh, that she actually has breast cancer? Now, if you're like most of us, you're, you're uh, getting an immediate headache and you wish you'd gone upstairs for the uh, cheese sandwich instead of coming here, and uh, <laughs> the, the best uh, description is uh, my old college roommate, Fred Sachs, who's the best scientist I know, and he says he hates this stuff. But uh, the next slide, Giga Renser then re-explained uh, the uh, uh, problem. So we're gonna, what we're going to do is I'm going to show you what is generally, not universally, but frequently taught as to how to analyze a problem like this. So what I'm going to do is, is give you a, a, a straightforward way. Uh, I recognize it's a bunch of numbers moving in a short period of time, but I think you can uh, catch on to it. Then I'm going to take this method, which is pretty straightforward, and I'm going to try to apply it to that red meat study. OK, so eight out of every 1,000 women have breast cancer. So uh, next slide is. Uh, oh, I, I'm sorry, I didn't read the whole thing for you. Eight out of every thousand women have breast cancer. Of the eight women with breast cancer, seven will have a positive mammogram. You see, that's exactly the same data explained in a different way. Of the 992 women who don't have breast cancer, about 70 will still have a positive mammogram. So I'll show you how. The, the right way to analyze this, and it is, as I say, taught in many medical schools, but what you do is you make a two-by-two two table, okay? And uh, you're going to fill in, across the uh, horizontal, you, you put the results in the mammogram, and uh, in the vertical columns, whether they actually have cancer or don't have cancer. So the total is eight, and we put the totals outside so you keep track of everything. And up next is of the eight women with breast cancer, seven will have a positive mammogram. So now that, that cell, that little box, is those people who have a positive mammogram and have cancer. So those, those are the true positives. And next, we uh, subtract that from the 1,000 women. So there are 992 who don't have breast cancer. Uh, next, we know from the information that 70 of those will still have a positive mammogram. So we put in the 70. So now the question is, if a woman has a positive mammogram, what's the probability she'll actually have breast cancer? We know the answer, because we add up the positive mammograms. That's the blue, there's seven. And 70 of the people who don't have cancer have it. So the total there is uh, some of those. And next, uh, we add up the 70 and the seven. So the true positives are seven. And the total probability is seven divided by 77, or 9%. So I think that was easy, or pretty easy. I, I recognize it's a little harder uh, going that fast. But if you run through it, you can see that we've just uh, rearranged the way we described the problem. And we can immediately see, what did we want to know? Well, we wanted to know wh who's in the box that have both a mammogram, a positive mammogram, and cancer. And this, incidentally, is, is um, uh, roughly real numbers. So uh, I don't think any oncologist would take any action based on the mammogram uh, uh, by itself without getting other uh, data and family history and so on. OK, so uh, we could also ask, uh, what is the prop? That's called the, uh, the uh, they call that the sensitivity of the test. So we're going to ask now, what is the, what they call the specificity, which is what are the true negatives? So next is the probability of true negatives. And that's called the, for some reason, the specificity, but I prefer calling it true negatives, 99%. So what that means is if you don't get a positive mammogram, you almost surely don't have cancer. Of course, if you do get one, you probably don't have cancer anyway. So that's uh, <laughs> something to think about. OK, let's go back to uh, this study. Uh, red meat uh, consumption causes type 2 diabetes. Next, 
next is uh, we look into some of the data. So what I'm going to show you is a simple approach, but you do have to dig around in the uh, all of the words in these studies. So uh, next we set up a uh, one of those two by two squares, and uh, there are 37,083. So we put that down in the corner so we can keep track of everything. That's that's the total we have. Next is one of these mind-boggling things, but we can zero in and we're just going to look at one of the studies. The, the general term is uh, uh, quartiles, but they just broke it up into five groups. And it, it, it's a good separation. Uh, the uh, people in the fifth quintile ate ten times as much red meat as the people in, in quintile one who were probably vegetarians. There's stuff wrong with this right off. Why, why do you do that? Why not list everybody? I mean, one of the things is to, t why not just take everybody's point and plot them out? And that's what's, it, you know, if you have uh, 37,000 points, well, what statistics is good at is telling you how to take a representative sample. You take every 50th one, and you, you can show that it's representative. And also, there's another problem with uh, Q5, and that is it does have a lot of red meat, but you don't know how well it's distributed. It's got a whole bunch of people in it. And, uh, it, you know, if some of us who were uh, eating the pork yesterday were in the quintiles, we would drive the average way up. So that can be uh, a problem. But let's, what we're going to do is we're going to uh, take it at face value. And we're going to, uh, next, we'll, put the number of, uh, these are all the red meat eaters. Okay, quintile five, we, we've lumped people, we've uh, broken them up by how much red meat they eat, and uh, quintile five has all the red meat eaters. So the next number there, okay. So now we need to find out uh, the cases. So here are all the five, they, they just showed you three of the quintiles, but here we have the five. Now what we need to look for is uh, looking on the left side is the cases, because we want to know how many people really got sick. So next, uh, that's just magnifying a quintile five, and it's the cases, and then that number is 655. So in the, the group with all the big red meat eaters, uh, there are 655 cases. So what am I doing here? Well, what I'm doing is I'm saying, suppose this is just like a diagnosis test, because the mammogram test, there's nothing about it that mathematically is, is uh, uh, tied to mammograms. Uh, so what we're going to do, and this is really unspoken what they were trying to do in the paper, is say, if you're a red meat eater, is that diagnostic of getting uh, uh, type 2 diabetes? And they're saying it's a good uh, diagnostic test. And we're asking, is it really a good diagnostic test? Because we have... Uh, the uh, 7,247 who are red meat eaters, and how many uh, cases do they get? So it's 655. Next, we put that in. And then uh, we subtract 655 from everybody, so we know how many people are in the red meat eater group. That is, they, they passed the test. They had a positive, a positive red meat test. We subtracted that from the total, and the 6,592 is the uh, people who uh, are big red meat eaters, but they uh, don't have a type 2 diabetes. In other words, they got a positive test, like a, a positive mammogram, but no cancer. The probability is uh, 655 over 7247, which coincidentally is also 9%. So this is not good data. So this paper is already uh, very suspect. So we fill in a couple of extra points. It's good to know how many are, are the true negatives. So we're adding up Q1 through Q4. We just have the numbers here. You don't have to look at that. Okay, so uh, what does it mean? So if you think of it as a diagnostic test, the 2432 cases, high red meat caught 655. I'm using the language of diagnosis. However, we have a lot of uh, false positives. So the sensitivity is 9%, and this is a lousy test. High amounts of red meat is not predictive of type 2 diabetes. And we do the same thing, testing negative. The specificity is uh, 94%. So that means that if you eat red meat, I mean, if you, don't, if you don't eat red meat, if you don't eat any red meat, you're not going to get diabetes. Of course, even if you do eat red meat, you're probably not going to get diabetes. Uh, 
The problem here is that they're using a method that can't really be applied to low incidence uh, diseases. And, and that's the problem here. You know, diabetes is a very serious disease, but if you take a, a population of 30,000 men uh, over a few years, only a few of them will develop diabetes. Okay, next. What you see in the literature frequently is relative risk, so I just thought I'd show you that. Th this is uh, plotted, I, I plotted out, the, I did the same thing we did to get the 9%, so I just asked what, what's the actual relative risk? The difference between those two is 4.3%, so if you take the ratio of 4.3 to 4.7, you see stuff like it, that in the journal, a 91% increase in risk. And, and what this is saying is that relative risk is almost always misleading, or, or the way I always describe it is, I can actually double your chances of winning the lottery. I'm gonna give you a strategy for doubling your chances. 100% uh, increase, you buy two tickets instead of one. So uh, that's not gonna make you uh, do it. So what you need to look at in these studies is what's the absolute difference. Uh, and that's 4.3%, and that's pretty low. It's not uh, zero, but when you look at this uh, from a different angle, you see that it's meaningless. What I did here is I took all of the uh, meat eaters in, in the different quintiles, and I averaged them up, and I took the the ones that got di diabetes, and I asked, well, suppose this thing was just random, you know, tennis balls thrown into tin cans, what would it look like? And you can see this, this is so close to, uh, so close to random that uh, you don't want to put much uh, on it. How do they come up with these numbers? Now, these, these are actually the relative risks they come up with. So 1.4 means that's the ratio of people in what they're targeting, namely hybrid meat eaters compared to, uh, to low. And it's not really uh, good, but the reason they get anything is that they correct for confounders. Uh, in other words, when you do an experiment, if you're looking at, say, red meat, and you see an effect, you have to cancel out the amount of, the effect of uh, uh, calories insofar as you can. So next, you can just do the next bunch of these. Uh, they actually, alcohol consumption, cigarettes, shirt size, uh, no, they didn't do that. Family history. Uh, what is missing, though, is the amount of carbohydrate. So they're not really asking whether a roast beef in a lettuce wrap is different than a uh, in a taco. So uh, mathematically, though, these are explanatory variables. So this is what you see in these studies. And uh, I'll finish up with a, a joke that uh, tells you what's wrong with dragging in all these confounders. So the woman calls the police because the guy across the street is exposing himself. And the cop comes and, and he says, lady, that window is too high, I can't see anything. And she says, sure, where you're standing, but stand on this chair, you'll see what I'm talking about. <laughs> so uh, if you have to go to all that trouble, it's not gonna be meaningful. Okay, thank you, that's it.